Good morning, everyone. It's me, Lloyd Baker, coming back into your homes. And there you are, sitting on your couch on a Sunday morning in your pajamas, just laying around, looking at your TV or your phone or your computer screen. And you should be in church. That's where you should be. <laughs> um, and what we used to say, you know, a couple months ago about sitting around on a Sunday morning is true now. I'm glad you're here with us. But I did this in front of the sign because you belong here with us and we're looking forward uh, to that time. I'm, I'm wearing my D-back shirt because I'm going to get back to baseball. I was watching TV last night and they do Thursday evening throwback games in one of the local channels. And it was the Diamondbacks against the Rockies in the 2017 wildcard game. This is how bad it's getting. I know the outcome of the game, but I am watching and hoping and almost praying that, you know, the, every situation I'm screaming or yelling or oh no, like it's actually happening right now. Um, so anyway, here's our weekly update. I want to get you caught up to um, what's going on at Streams Church and where we're headed. Um, I know that you're frustrated. I get that. I'm frustrated and I understand how there are all kinds of people that are going through all kinds of situations, whether it's a lost work or um, paychecks or just not being together with your family or maybe parents that you can't see. I get the frustration. I understand the frustration. I have personal feelings. It just feels like all the numbers they threw out seem to be off. Um, and, but we don't know. We have no idea what would have happened. So regardless of my personal feelings, I just want to fill you in on why I think we do the things we do at Streams Church. It's interesting in Matthew uh, chapter 22, I think it is, that Jesus is trying to be trapped by the religious leaders. And so one of the religious leaders asked him this question, should we pay taxes? And I wish Jesus' answer would have been, no, you don't have to pay taxes, but he didn't say that. Um, he said, listen, give to Caesar, Roman Empire. He looked at the coin, he said, who's, who's, him, who's picture? And they said, Caesar, well, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. And there was this concept of, I'm not here to deal with all the political mess. I'm here on mission for the kingdom of God. And then a little later in that same conversations, they're trying to trap him, they ask them, tell us what the greatest commandment is. And he just said something like this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the mission. What's interesting is you go over to Luke's gospel, it tells the same story. Luke adds another little element, and the element is, tell me who my neighbor is. So Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we know in that parable, he says, that's your neighbor, the one who is an outcast of society, who doesn't, who's not like them, who is beat up and thrown into a ditch. And he says, that's your neighbor, care for that person. And the illustration is, that the weakest and the marginalized and those at risk, that's the mission of the church, not only the church, but probably us as well as in our individual lives, apart from what we think anywhere else. So I'm frustrated too, I get it, but our mission right now has got to be about um, those who are at risk and those who are marginalized and, and, the, and joining greater humanity. So that's why I, I follow along and if you know that um, President Trump has put out some plans on going forward and what he hopes the governors will adopt. Governor Ducey came back last week, didn't really give us a whole lot of information, but he said this week coming up, we're going to have more information. But if um, our government in Arizona follows the guidelines that Trump gives, there are three phases. And phase one is uh, groups of 10 with strict guidelines for social distancing. And then group Phase two is groups of 50 with more moderate. Um, and then phase three is us getting back into a, a normal um, way of life. So we're going to try to really leverage that right now and try to be ready and prepared at Streams Church. So we have groups that meet all the time, but we're going to re, re sort of reinvent that a little bit. We call them circles of 10. And so getting in groups of circles of 10 that we can do online right now, creating conversations. And so in the next week, you should be getting information about the Circles of Ten or maybe being an invitation in or how you can join a Circle of Ten if you're not. 
so that we can then, when phase one rolls out, we can actually have gatherings in people's backyards of, of, of circles of 10 and have some times of fellowship and church and keeping our social distancing or in somebody's house and uh, start phase one. Of, we'll be ready to go to start meeting as a church. And perhaps you know this, that around the world, believers and followers of Jesus don't meet in, in buildings. They meet in small groups. In fact, we were in uh, the Ukraine once ministering to the gypsies. They had no buildings. They had no, they had no money. So they literally got together in front of a person's house and there'd be 10 or 15 here and 20 or 30 over there. And so we're going to be ready for that at Streams Church. So be looking for that circles of 10 coming up next week. If you don't have information, you'll go to our website. You're going to find it there. And then the second thing is we'll get ready for phase two. So when phase two happens, we're going to get our, our sanctuary and our rooms at the church um, ready for having groups up to 50. And uh, then you'll take your circle of 10 and join a couple others. And then during the week, we'll find times that we can come together and maybe have some acoustic worship or something on this screen or some teaching and some times that we can just get together in our groups of 50 until we're allowed to gather again as a congregation. So uh, we're making plans. We're getting everything ready. We're bringing in cleaning stations and places that we can make sure that when we can come together, because you belong here, we can come together and rejoice together as a family like we should be um, together. And as the scripture tells us that we should not forsake the coming together. So I can't wait for that day. I miss you. Um, we're excited that we're going to go forward. Um, today's going to be a great service and we're going to have our children's pastor and our youth pastor come and give you some updates and how you and your children and youth can get connected to um, our church right now online. So thanks. God bless. the children's pastor here at Streams Church. I wanted to invite you guys to my Facebook group and page for Streams Kids. So what you'll do is you will go on Facebook and you'll type in Streams Kids AZ, follow our page and group. This group is a lot of fun. Um, and we, during the week we have Zoom parties for kids so kids can do dance parties, we play games, we do devos together, um, we laugh, it's just a great good time. Um, also during this week I'm going to release a sign up for a parent Zoom party and it's just an opportunity I want you guys to connect I want to connect with you guys see how you're all doing see how we can help each other just bring hope and community to this um, time that we're in um, also um, on our group you will find lessons for you guys to do on Sundays with your kids um, there is parent guides to help you lead your family um, and to learn more about Jesus and more about God's truth. Um, there's videos, and it's a whole lot of fun. So I hope you guys hop on and come hang out with us. Have a good week. Talk to you later. Bye. Love ya. Hey, what's up, Streams Church? Hey, this is Pastor Mitch here, and I just want to say that we thank you for your support and prayers for our youth ministry. Um, this week we actually have some cool stuff coming up. We're going to be doing a series on anxiety and depression for our teens starting this Sunday. Uh, that, me that message will be going up on YouTube uh, at 11. Uh, you can look that up. Just type in Streams Youth and you'll find it on, on our YouTube channel. Also, uh, Sunday night we're doing small groups. It's going to be a great time and we're going to have a, actually have a Bible plan that is talking about anxiety starting from Sunday to Sunday. It'll be a seven day devotional on anxiety that we would love for our uh, teenagers to get involved in. And then we're doing things almost every night. Uh, we're gonna have an Instagram live where one of our students is gonna go on on Monday, Tuesday, we're doing a Netflix watch party, which is gonna be awesome. And then also if you um, are not already following us on our Instagram, uh, streamsyouth underscore AZ, and then if you're not um, connected through parent email, I would love for you guys to, to get involved in that. So you can email me at mitch at streamschurch.org um, and I'll get you put on that uh, parent email. But thank you for your prayers. I love you, Streams family. Um, thank you for your continued support. Church. I'm 
Jackie Owens, I'm your worship director. So excited you guys have tuned in to join us for service today. Um, again, as I said last week, I just get so excited when I know that you guys are gathering. We're all together. Even though we're apart, we're together and we're worshiping together. And that does something in the kingdom. So welcome to our home. Um, welcome to our living room. We're just going to worship today. But I wanted to share a scripture out of Matthew 18. And it says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it would be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Church feels really different right now, and it feels different in good ways and in, in awkward ways. But there's one thing that doesn't change, and that's God's presence. His presence is evident in your hearts. His presence is evident in your homes. When you walk into your home, you bring the presence of Jesus. And so he is with you. And so as you worship today, know that his presence is there among you. His presence is here with me as Kayla and I worship together, as you guys worship together in your home. And there's something about that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The things that you are praying for today, I want you to know that you carry authority in your prayers. Because Jesus, because the God, the God of all, the great I am, God Almighty, the King of kings, has already gone before you and done everything that you need him to do. He's already gone through it. He, he has no concept of time. He's already gone before us. And so whatever we contend for, whatever we are praying into, where two of you are gathered and two of you are in agreement, he is there among you. Let's worship together this morning. Yeah. 
stop working He will never stop He will never stop working Even when I don't see it you're working Even when I don't feel it you're working You never stop He never stop working He never stop He never stop It's your
in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to all we Oh, great are you, great are you. Church. This is Joella Bassett. I'm outside getting a few vitamin D's here in this beautiful day. There seems to be a, there is a lot of fear going on right now. Fear in the news, fear of we don't know what's happening, fear of what we could lose, fear of what could happen. And I feel that we need to be encouraging each one in the Word of God. We need to know the promises of the Lord, and we need to stand on those promises. So I want to share with you today I, from Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. The people were getting ready to go in the Promised Land, and Moses said, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We can give each other opinions. We can give each other our ideas. But I really feel we need to encourage each other in the, Lord, in the Word. And we know that the Lord will never forsake us. He will go before us. So let me pray that over you today. Jesus, I just thank you for your presence in our lives. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us, teach us, and direct us. I thank you that we do not have a spirit of fear, but we have power and love and a sound mind because we have Jesus in us. And I pray for our congregation today, for our people, Lord, that we will be strong, knowing that you never leave us, that you will go with us and you will guide us and lead us through this time father thank you for your faithfulness thank you for your word thank you for your love and your peace in jesus name i pray amen we started a sermon series last week based off of isaiah chapter 61 I thought it was really appropriate for the time that we're living in right now in this season. Isaiah is a prophet to the nation of Israel, and at that time they had been taken off into captivity, so they're enslaved um, by a foreign nation. It says this, the prophecy about the Lord Jesus, the coming Messiah, says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and the Father has anointed me to do several things. And it's proclaim good news to the poor and to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to uh, recovery of sight, to the blind, um, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Um, and as we mentioned last week, if you're a follower of Jesus, what year is the Lord's favor? Well, it's this year, and it's last year, and it's the year coming up. You're favored no matter what the circumstances. Circumstances don't change the favor of the Lord. And you may say, well, it doesn't feel very good right now. Uh, to which my reply would be Romans 8, 28, that we know, you know that in all things God is working for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I love the way Chris Volatin says it, that in the end, God always works out um, good for those who love him. And if it's not good, it's not the end, that we're still in a process, that he's not finished with us yet. And so in the end, God brings, uh, Jesus brings, in the end, Jesus always brings beauty out of ashes and that's what this prophecy said that we ask the question and we ask you to do a little exercise at home with your family what has paused or possibly it's gone away that we hope doesn't return are there things in our life or things in our society that seem like they've been burned to the ground and like that's a good thing we hope they don't come back um what do we Hope comes back that maybe it's been dormant for a long time. So maybe it's been a long time since you have just had focused family time or gone on uh, bike rides or things that a simpler life that perhaps we used to live in the United States that you hope now comes back to life or things that you hope or you know need, need an upgrade. And we said Jesus always brings beauty out of the ashes because the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and the Lord has anointed him. 
And then we said this, John chapter 14, verse 12 says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, Jesus, will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And so now we are anointed and we are called and we have the presence of Holy Spirit. And we have the opportunity right now in this world to go out there and help bring beauty out of all the ashes that we see. So let's read the scripture out of Isaiah 61 and then we'll continue on with the sermon series and the message for today. Isaiah chapter 61, verses one through three. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And we read in the scripture that after beauty of ashes is the oil of joy for mourning. And oil had a significant use in Old Testament times. It was used for celebrating. So when there was a festival or a feast or some type of celebration, they would pour um, some oil on people as a sign of of celebration so the next time we can get together you have a party at your house soon hopefully you can have somebody outside you know sprinkling some evo extra virgin olive oil on your friends or take some crisco and you know knock them upside the head with a little crisco oil and say hey it's time to party the oil's here um and so what does that mean for us well it doesn't mean this it doesn't mean that we ignore mourning that's not what the scripture is saying we don't mourn well at times in the kingdom of God. And I see people all the time that try to push not only themselves, but other people through a process that may be good. It may take time for us to get through and understand. So it's not a lack of faith for somebody to miss something that's gone. It's not a lack of faith or understanding of heaven for you to miss a loved one. That's not it at all. Mourning is, is, is um, a part of life that we go through. And it's just... We have to help one another. When I was uh, a, young, a young lad in my late teens, we moved back to Arizona and we lived with my grandmother and my grandfather, my mom and I did. And back in those days, you really didn't realize that sunburns probably weren't the best thing for you. In fact, it was pretty cool to get a suntan. So when I would go out and I come home with a sunburn, my grandmother would go out in the backyard and she had in our little back patio yard, she was growing aloe vera and she would take and break off one of the spines, I guess it's spines, leaves, I don't know what they're called on aloe vera plants. She would come in and she would just squeeze, some of you know, um, this goop out, this aloe vera goop out of the, the end of it. And she would then put that on my burns and she would wipe it on my burns. Of course, now everything has aloe vera in it, but she knew that that would bring healing, that the oil, if you will, of that plant brought healing to the burn on my skin. And I think right now, the church needs to be the ones who bring healing uh, to that which is lost. We bring clarity when all the dust is settled. We lead the way uh, through a new reality because we will need healing in our land. We need the oil of joy for mourning. When Jesus came, the nation of Israel had gone through a very, very dark time. And they were convinced the Messiah would come and overthrow the Roman Empire, that, Roman Empire that had oppressed them for so long, and that he would set up a new kingdom for them that would rule and reign. Um, I think they thought that was the answer. And I think, unfortunately, many of us think, or the government thinks that the answer is this relief package that we're getting. It's really gonna help. I'm not saying that, I appreciate it. But relief packages don't bring joy. They might bring happiness, but they don't bring joy. Getting back to normal, uh, normal is not really the answer. It might bring happiness, but it won't bring joy. Getting, you know, getting to see your friends again, uh, getting out and, and uh, sitting in at your favorite restaurant, going to Starbucks with people, 
bring happiness. They don't bring joy. Joy only comes with the heart trans transformation. Joy comes from being set free from this crazy rat race, from debilitating materialism. Joy comes from seeing what is really true. And Jesus is anointed, um, and he has the ability to give to us the oil of joy for mourning. And in the same way that when he came to Israel, he didn't come to change their circumstances, he came to change their heart. So that in any circumstance, they would know true joy. I love the Christmas story. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it really lays out to them why the Messiah came. This is a New Living Translation. Chapter 2, verse 8 says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy for all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And so in the middle of distress, in the middle of the time that they were looking for a change in their circumstances, the angel said, don't be afraid. Great joy is coming who will bring um, change to the world through uh, a heart transformation. It's the oil of joy. It's anointing of Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not ignoring the mourning, but it's this deep sense that no matter what the circumstance, I can have um, deep joy. The circumstances don't define me. My Father defines me. My Father in heaven has defined me. and He loved me so much that He sent His Son to die for my sins. He loves me so much that He has given Holy Spirit to be ever present with me. And uh, the Bible describes Holy Spirit very well. In John 14, 17, it says, The Spirit of truth, who doesn't allow me to walk in ignorance, of sin, the deception of my enemy, or the lies of the world. That's Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of truth. In Romans 8, 2, it says that He is the Spirit of life that sets me free from the bondage of sin. Hebrews 10, 29 tells me He's the Spirit of grace, favor, when I deserve death. Romans chapter 1, 4 says He's the Spirit of holiness, so that I might live a life of, of honor for my king. And 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, He is my justifier and my sanctifier. So I stand perfect in relationship with my father. 1 Peter 4, 14 tells me that I don't have to be offended. I don't have to defend myself when others insult me because Holy Spirit is the spirit of glory that is upon me and rests on me. And Ephesians 1, 17 says, He is my wisdom and my revelation when I need direction in my confusion and my uncertainty. Romans 8, 26 says, He helps me in my weaknesses and speaks and prays through me when I don't have the words to speak and pray. And Acts 1, 8 says that He is my dynamite power from on high. That's Holy Spirit. Allow me to pray over you, Romans 5.15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of Holy Spirit. Joy. He is my comforter when I'm hurting. He is my wisdom when I'm confused, my counselor when I'm lost, my power when I need strength. He is the oil of joy in my morning. We know the one. We know joy. Holy Spirit is here to anoint us for that. Nehemiah is a great reference. We talked about him last week. He's a great reference because Nehemiah was sent to a place to rebuild what was lost. 
And uh, so we mentioned it last week. We're going to talk about a little of the scripture today. We'll mention it again next week. But here's the scripture about Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah is a great reference point, giving instructions that we will need as we go forward to rebuild our society. Uh, in moments like this, the emotional toil is, is overwhelming. The mental health is, is being attacked. Uh, personal discouragement is invasive. Um, Nehemiah said their strength gave out because, first of all, they had to remove all the rubble or all the trash or all the broken down pieces in their city. And I'm convinced that when life returns, there's going to be so many things that will be exposed, some good um, and some not so good. I mean, I, I have a feeling in nine months there will be a, a new generation of isolation babies. I don't know what they'll be called, but I'm sure there will be just a surge of isolation babies. But I also have this sad sinking feeling that divorces are going to be on the rise, will be skyrocketing, that mental health issues would be at an all-time high, um, addictions that people thought they had taken care of and buried, um, resolved, are going to be coming back. We already know that. And ravaging a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of rubble uh, there when we come back. A lot of things that will need to be removed. And it will be a time of, of mourning for many, many people. In 2011, two months after the great earthquake that rocked Japan and just devastated lands. I took a team of young people there and uh, my daughter Brittany was with us and some of you might remember Jake Hopper was with us and and Rhino, Ryan Norman was with us and I remember those three and they were just working so hard but the first thing that we had to do we walked into the city in Ishinomaki and first of all they walked us from where the ocean was all the way back it was two miles before you could find any just houses and then they showed us like if you hear sirens this is only two months after you hear sirens that's the mountain you run to and so they walked us through but we, the first thing that had to be done in that city is all the the trash and everything had to be removed and there were we were in a house and right behind us there was a car that was upside down like this pointing down in somebody's backyard where the water had left it and so Brittany and Rhino and Jake Hopper, the first thing they had to do is they had to start cleaning out the gutters of the city. And it was just oil-drenched goop, and um, it, it wasn't pretty. And it was dead fish and people's belongings. And they were all, you know, had all the protective gear on, and they were just going in and cleaning it out. And I was in one house, and the house that we were in, the people hadn't returned um, and it's assumed that they were lost at sea. They were carried away. And so water went up to the clock. And I, I have a picture of it. The clock was dead stopped in the moment that the water hit there. And um, I was looking through pictures, uh, family pictures that were all over the place and gathering them just in case they came back. We were, we were holding them for them. And that nation was grieving. And for them to be grieving and expect them to be able to clean up all the debris it would just be too difficult for them in a state of mourning. And so we were there and there were other people from other nations and they were so grateful to us and people were going out and getting us snacks and bringing them to us and bowing and thanking to us. And on our way home, we went to a Japanese baseball game and it was standing room only and we're standing in the back and these group of people that were sitting in front of us in the bleachers asked us why they were there. Somebody spoke English. We told them. 
And they got up and thanked us and gave us their seats. That's my people, Japan, and my grandchildren are half Japanese. And I was touched, but they needed people to come in and to clean it up because in their own grief, they couldn't do it. Um, and I think we're going to be in that place coming up soon where there's going to be a lot of, of issues that have arisen and, and trash and broken down things that, that we, we have the opportunity to bring Holy Spirit, the oil of joy in the midst of their mourning. And I love the way Nehemiah did it. He literally had families fighting for one another, for brothers and sisters and watching for children. And, and there was a moment in the rebuilding of the wall when the enemy was attacking them and trying to tear them down that Nehemiah literally had one person working while one person held a sword protecting them. And they came together as families to rebuild this wall. And I think that message is so important for us because we not only need to be coming together as as physical families, mothers and fathers, and protecting one another. But we need to come together as a spiritual family when we get the opportunity. And we're going to be fighting for one another. Things that harm or mourning or whatever it is, we're going to be there in the midst of them. We're going to have the opportunity to bring the oil of joy. And not only for our spiritual family, I, I think the family of humanity, we're going to be the ones. And so that's why I love verse 4 of the scripture in Isaiah because it just explains it so well. So here it is. Isaiah 61 verses 3 and 4. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Did you catch that? That the ones who have had, had the great exchange, beauty for ashes in the Lord's early morning, um, they will become oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of His glory. They will be the ones who rebuild ancient cities, who restore the places devastated, who renew the ruined cities, we are the ones who do that. Why? Because we are oaks of righteousness. Like oaks, we are the ones who stand strong. We are not moved by all the winds. We are firmly rooted in our faith in Christ. We are anointed by Holy Spirit. We know the one who binds the brokenhearted. He proclaims freedom for the captives. He releases prisoners out of their darkness. He proclaims favor on his children. He bestows beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy and stored of mourning. And he is the only one who can. He's the only one. I don't know if you know that. He's the only one. Um, did you know that... Um, other religions will tell you they can make you more enlightened if you will do this and this and that. I'll make you more holy if you follow my rules and regulations. That's what other religions say. The other religions say, I'll give you more peace if you meditate or hum this or hum that. But there's only one. Only one who says, bring me your trash. Bring me all your rubble. Bring me your broken down walls, your emotional distress, your crushed dreams, your broken cities. Bring them to me. And in return, I'll give you goodness for your poverty. I'll give you healing for your broken hearts. I will give you freedom from your prison and sight to your blindness. I'll give you favor for your disgrace. I'll give you beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for your mourning. He turns shame into glory. He turns graves into gardens. He turns bones <laughs> into armies. He turns seas 
into highways. And he is the only one who can. He's the only one who promised he ever would. He's the only one. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come to Jesus and said, I can't deal with this trash anymore. I can't turn with, with all this brokenness anymore. I need to give it to you. And I need you to turn it around. Because I am at my wit's end. I am in a place of loss in a morning. I am broken and I can't do it on my own. If it relied on me, I'd be in trouble. And that's why Jesus says, bring it to me. And I will deal with it. I died for your sins. And I don't know if you've ever done that. I just want to pray a simple prayer. And if, if you're there, right there, wherever you are, if you're watching a computer or TV or laptop, whatever that is, or your phone, it doesn't matter. No matter where you're at, you can pray this prayer. You can say, Lord Jesus, uh, you, you're the one who died for my sins. I know that. I ask you to forgive me for the things that I've done to you, uh, the things I've done for, against other people. And I know that I've sinned, so I ask you to forgive me. I know that you paid that price on the cross. And so today I bring you all this stuff in my life I can't deal with, all the brokenness, all the pain, all the trash in my life. And I just give it to you because I know you're the only one that can deal with that and take it and return give me beauty. So I believe that today. And I believe, Lord Jesus, that you rose from the dead and you have power to overcome all the things that, that want to destroy my life. So I thank you for your resurrection power that you're alive today, interceding on my behalf. I believe that. So today I commit my life to you. I turn my life over to you, all of it. I come to you just as I am. Take it, please. And I believe you will, and you'll give me something beautiful in exchange. And I believe that prayer, and I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. You don't have to repeat my words. You can just say from a sincere heart, amen, make it so, I agree. And the Bible says that he comes in and his spirit gives you the oil of joy in the midst of your mourning. His spirit makes you a child of God. You are beloved. You are favored. And that's great news. I thought we could end today with that new song that Jackie's been singing to us, Grave to Gardens, and just finish today in a point of worship, allowing, us, allowing her to lead us in that one last time. Thank you and God bless you.